Hello. Welcome to Storytime with Moog. I am Moog. And today we are continuing on with The Phantom of the Opera by Gaston Leroux, starting with chapter 22. But first, reading updates. I am reading Akin by Emma Donahue. I am more than halfway through. It is pretty slow, um, but things are building. So there's a couple different things going on. Of course there are. But we have in a 79-year-old friend named Noah, and he is tra- planning to travel to France to visit his, like, uh, birth country and his like birthplace and all of these things and he also has a couple photographs that his mom brought over when uh, when she moved to the states and he doesn't know who these people are and he doesn't know the building that the photo is like in front of or like the people are in front of so he's trying to figure all of this out and learn more about like his mom and his past and all of these things but at the same time he uh, suddenly becomes a guardian for a sort of distant relative, um, a, an 11-year-old boy named Michael, whose mom is currently in prison and his dad had died. He was uh, staying with his grandma, but his grandma had also died, and he lives in, like, a more, um, impoverished part of New York than, uh, Noah does, and so, like, we're getting not only, uh, like, generational differences, but also class differences, and just, like, their experiences are totally different. Um, so he's just come into being his guardian and is, has to bring Michael with him to, France. And so there's also that like cultural difference that Noah is super, super interested in and like getting all of these like really extremely French foods. And Michael is like, can I have a Coke and chicken nuggets, please? (laughs) So there's, there's that whole thing. And then we just got information, which I'm not going to say because it is a spoiler. We just got information that is having Noah try and figure out is is more puzzled by his his past and i have an idea of what's going to happen and it is different than the idea of or the path that that noah is going down so i'm interested to see like how this is going but it is slow moving um if you're like a fast paced type book meter reader i don't know um don't pick this one up <laughs> when it comes to book When it comes to books, is there any type I refuse to read due to their subject matter? Um, I don't think so. Um, I mean, I mostly don't read nonfiction, but I do sprinkle it in throughout the year, but I'm more drawn to, I don't know, like, twisty uh dystopian fantasy science fiction like those types are the ones that I feel like most comfortable with but no I don't think that there's anything where it's like I will never read this type because there it might just be like in every genre I feel like there's a book that like will resonate with somebody although I'm not I also hope don't read romance <laughs> I mean every once in a while but you know. Um, <laughs> today we are going to be reading Phantom of the Opera, starting with chapter two or twenty-two. What am I saying? Okay. Um. Oops. I'm trying. I always. I did not take notes. I know last time I said that I was going to take notes to see like where I start. But I didn't. I didn't do that. So let me, give me like two seconds to see what's going on. Oh, okay. I know what's going on. 
Okay, so last time, what we read, um, we know that Christine Day has disappeared um, from, like, during a performance, the lights went out. She disappeared, the lights went on, nobody knows where she is. Um, and last time we got different perspectives of our, like, main character groups and what was happening during this, like, period. So we got Raul and his, like, running around trying to find her. We got the um, the managers and what they were doing and trying to figure out, um, like, how the opera ghost is getting paid. And Madame Geary gave this whole story about, like, yeah, you give me the money and then I change the money and put fake money in the box. And then I put the real money in your pocket and the ghost takes it from there. Um, and let's see. Oh, and then we meet... What's his name? I don't remember his name. Don't remember his name. Oh, because we don't have a name. We meet a, our Persian friend. And him and Raul are underneath the stage because our Persian friend is like, I know where to find Christine. So they are wandering around underneath the stage um, to get to the lake house. But they have to go a specific way so that the opera ghost doesn't find him. All of these things. It's very chaotic. Um, while they're down there, they find the rat catcher, which is a terrifying but accurate name. And it, he's just like a, a flaming skull with like a bunch of rats chasing after him. Um, and the rat catcher was like, just let me do my thing. And they were like, okay. Um, so nobody really was really bothered by it, but they have to backtrack because the way that they were going was closed off. So they backtrack they go through this other way and they plop into the torture chamber. And then we sort of get a flashback. So the Persian, our Persian friend knows, um, the opera ghost, Eric, from before and Eric is a little crazy he's a little much um he enjoys uh torturing people great and he was impressing this one person and she got into torturing people and it's it's a whole thing so when they plopped down into this torture chamber our Persian friend is looking around and is terrified because he knows all of the terrible things that Eric and this other woman have done to other people like people they even knew like their guests in their home um and so he's like super not excited to be in this torture chamber that looks exactly like the one from the before times and that's where we left off I think of course, if I forgot something, we'll pause and I'll be like, oh yeah, this is the thing that's huge and I forgot to mention it. <sighs> All right, so let's get cozy. Why did I say that? Like, maybe that's a good idea. I, I don't know. I don't know. Let's get cozy. <laughs> All right. Chapter 22. Oh, and to give an idea of, like, how much we have left, we are 71% of the way through. But there are 26 chapters and then an epilogue. And my little, my little reader here, oopsie. Oh, no. I've touched it and I've messed everything up. Um, my little reader here says that there are three hours and 23 minutes left in this book. But I don't know how much of that chunk is going to be notes so we'll just wing it like we always do all right chapter 22 in the torture chamber the persians narrative continued oh okay that's right the last chapter was told from the perspective of the persians narrative so it was like all like a first hand type deal instead of like how it is now where it's like the writer is writing all the things that like they have found out from like interviews or newspaper articles or whatever. I forgot that that was like a layer that was part of this. Okay. We were in the middle of a little six cornered room, the sides of which were covered with mirrors from top to bottom. 
in the corners, we could clearly see the joins in the glasses, the segments intended to turn on their gear. Yes, I recognized them, and I recognized the iron tree in the corner, at the bottom of one of those segments. The iron tree with its iron branches for the hanged man. Creepy. <laughs> I seized my companion's arm. The Comte de Chagny was all a quiver, eager to shout to his betrothed that he was bringing her help. I fear that he would not be able to contain himself. Suddenly, we heard a noise on our left. It sounded at first like a door opening and shutting in the next room. And then there was a dull moan. I clutched Monsieur de Chagny's arm more firmly still, and then we distinctly heard these words. You must make your choice, the wedding mass or the requiem mass. I recognized the voice of the monster. There was another moan, followed by a long silence. I was persuaded by now that the monster was unaware of our presence in his house, for otherwise he would certainly have managed not to let us hear him. He would only have had to close the in little invisible window through which the torture lovers looked down into the torture chamber. Besides, I was certain that, if he had known of our presence, the tortures would have begun at once. The important thing was not to let him know, and I dreaded nothing so much as the impulsiveness of the Vicomte, who wanted to rush through the walls to Christine, whose moans we continued to hear at intervals. The Requiem Mass is not at all happy, Eric's voice resumed, whereas the Wedding Mass, you can take my word for it, is magnificent. You must take a resolution and know your mind. I can't go on living like this, like a mole in a burrow. Don Juan Triumphant is finished, and now I want to live like everybody else. I want to have a wife like everybody else, and to take her out on Sundays. I have invented a mask that makes me look like anybody. People will not even turn around in the streets. You will be the happiest of women, and we will sing all by ourselves till we swoon away with delight. You're crying. You are afraid of me, and yet I am not really wicked. Love me, and you shall see. All I wanted was to be loved for myself. If you loved me, I should be as gentle as a lamb, and you could do anything with me that you pleased. Um, having a mask that looks like it could be anybody is terrifying and just reminds me of a skin mask and I don't want it. I don't like that. I don't like that. <laughs> it's not a great look. <laughs> Soon the moans that accompanied this sort of love's litany increased and increased. I've never heard anything more despairing. And Monsieur and I recognized that this terrible lamentation came from Eric himself. Christine seemed to be standing dumb with horror, without the strength to cry out, while the monster was on his knees before her. Three times over, Eric fiercely bewailed his fate. Don't love me. You don't love me. You don't love me. And then, more gently, why do you cry? You know it gives me pain to see you cry. A silence. Each silence gave us fresh hope. We said to ourselves, Perhaps he has left Christine behind the wall. And we thought only of the possibility of warning Christine of our presence, unknown to the monster. We were unable to leave the torture chamber now, unless Christine opened the door to us and it was only on this condition that we could hope to help her, for we did not even know where the door might be. Suddenly, the silence in the next room was disturbed by the ringing of an electric bell. There was a bound on the other side of the wall, and Eric's voice of thunder. Somebody ringing. Walk in, please. A sinister chuckle. Who has come bothering now? Wait for me here. I am going to tell the siren to open the door. Steps moved away. A door closed. 
I had no time to think of the fresh horror that was preparing. I forgot that the monster was going, was only going out perhaps to perpetuate. Nope. I forgot that the monster was only going out perhaps to perpetrate a fresh crime. I understood but one thing. Christine was alone behind the wall. The Comte was already calling to her. Christine! Christine! As we could hear what was said in the next room, there was no reason why my companion should not be heard in his turn. Nevertheless, the Viscount had to repeat his cry time after time. At last, a faint voice reached us. I am dreaming, it said. Christine! Christine! It is I, Raoul! A silence. But answer me, Christine. In heaven's name, if you are alone, answer me. Then Christine's voice whispered Raoul's name. Yes, yes, it is I. It is not a dream. Christine, trust me. We are here to save you. But be prudent. When you hear the monster, warn us. Then Christine gave way to fear. She trembled lest Eric should discover where Raoul was hidden. She told us in a few hurried words that Eric had gone quite mad with love, and that he had decided to kill everybody and himself with everybody, if she did not consent to become his wife. He had given her till eleven o'clock the next evening for reflection. It was the last respite. She must choose, as he said, between the wedding mass and the requiem. And Eric had then uttered a phrase which Christine did not quite understand. Yes or no. If you if your answer is no, everybody will be dead and buried. But I understood the sentence perfectly, for it corresponded in a terrible manner with my own dreadful thought. I, a little too dramatic, Eric. <laughs> Can you tell us where Eric is? I asked. She replied that he must have left the house. Could you make sure? No, I'm fastened. I cannot stir a limb. When we heard this, Monsieur and I gave a yell of fury. Our safety, the safety of all three of us, depended on the girl's liberty of movement. But where are you? asked Christine. There are only two doors in my room. The Louis-Philippe room, of which I told you, Raoul, a door through which Eric comes and goes, and another which he has never opened before me, and which he has forbidden me to ever go through, because he says it is the most dangerous of the doors, the door of the torture chamber. Bum, bum, bum! Christine, that is where we are. You are in the torture chamber? Yes, but we cannot see the door. Oh, if I could only drag myself so far, I would knock at the door, and that would tell you where it is. Is it a door with a lock on it? I asked. Yes, with a lock. Mademoiselle, I said, it is absolutely necessary that you should open that door to us. But how? asked the poor girl tearfully. We heard her straining, trying to free herself from the bonds that held her. I know where the key is she said in a voice that seemed exhausted by the effort she made. But I am fastened so tight. Oh, the wretch. Can't talk being tortured. <laughs> and she gave a sob. Where is the key? I asked, signing to Monsieur not to speak and to leave the business to me, for we had not a moment to lose. In the next room, near the organ, and another little bronze key, which he also forbade me to touch. They are both in a little leather bag, which he calls the bag of life and death. Raoul, Raoul, fly. Everything is mysterious and terrible here, and Eric will soon have gone quite mad, and you are in the torture chamber. Go back by the way you came. There must be a reason why the room is called by that name. There is a reason, Christine. <laughs> I'm pretty sure, um, it's in the name. <laughs> Christine, said the young man, we will go from here together or die together. We must keep cool, I whispered. Why has he fastened you, mademoiselle? 
You can't escape from this house, and he knows it. I tried. Oh, all right. Trigger warning here. Here we go. Uh, I tried to commit suicide. The monster went out last night after carrying me here, fainting and half chloroformed. He was going to his banker, so he said. When he returned, he found me with my face covered with blood. I had tried to kill myself by striking my forehead against the walls. That sounds awful. Absolutely awful. Christine, groaned Raoul, and he began to sob. Then he bound me, and I am not allowed to die until eleven o'clock tomorrow evening. Mademoiselle, I declared, the monster bound you, and he shall unbind you. You have only to play the necessary part. Remember that he loves you. Alas, we heard, am I likely to forget it? Remember it and smile to him. Entreat him. Tell him that your bonds hurt you. But Christine said, Hush, I hear something in the wall on the lake. It is he. Go away. Go, go away. We could not go away, even if we wanted to, I said, as impressively as I could. We cannot leave this, and we are in the torture chamber. Hush, whispered Christine again. Heavy steps sounded slowly behind the wall, then stopped and made the floor creak once more. Next came a tremendous sigh, followed by a cry of horror from Christine, and we heard Eric's voice. I beg your pardon for letting you see a face like this. What a state I am in. Am I not? It's the other one's fault. Why did he ring? Do I ask people who pass to tell me the time? He will never ask anybody the time again. It is the siren's fault. He will never ask anybody the time again. Eric, what'd you do? What'd you do there, bud? Are you just being scary, or did something happen? <laughs> Phantom of the Opera 2. Everybody wins. <laughs> it's all just them going out for ice cream together. Maybe pizza. It would not be much of a torture room if you could just leave. You're right. Accurate. Christine. <laughs> they can't leave. <laughs> Another sigh, deeper, more tremendous still, came from the abysmal depths of a soul. Why did you cry out, Christine? Because I am in pain, Eric. Oh, I thought I had frightened you. Eric, unloose my bonds. Am I not your prisoner? You will try to kill yourself again. You have given me till eleven o'clock tomorrow evening, Eric. The footsteps dragged along the floor again. Mm. The footsteps dragged along the floor again. After all, as we are to die together, and I am just as eager as you. Yes, I have had enough of this life, you know. Wait, don't move. I will release you. You have only one word to say. No. And it will be once, and it will at once be over with everybody. You are right. You are right. Why wait till eleven o'clock tomorrow evening? True. It would have been grander. Finer. But that is childish nonsense. We should only think of ourselves in this life. Of our own death. The rest doesn't matter. You're looking at me because I am all wet. Oh, my dear. It's raining cats and dogs outside. Apart from that... Christine, I think I am subject to hallucinations. You know, the man who rang at the siren's door just now? Go and look if he's ringing at the bottom of the lake well. He was rather like... There, turn around. Are you glad? You're free now. Oh, my poor Christine, look at your wrists. Tell me, have I hurt them? That alone deserves death. Talking of death, I must sing his requiem. Hearing these terrible remarks, I received an awful presentiment. I, too, had once rung at the monster's door, and, without knowing it, must have set some warning current in motion. And I remembered the two arms that had emerged from the inky waters. What poor wretch had strayed to that shore this time? Who was the other one? The one whose requiem we now heard sung? Eric sang like the god of thunder, sang 
uh, yes, I Ray. I'm doing my best. <laughs> that enveloped us as in a storm. The elements seemed to rage around us. Suddenly, the organ and the voice ceased so suddenly that Monsieur sprang back on the other side of the wall with emotion. And the voice changed and, and transformed, distinctly grated out these metallic syllables. What have you done with my bag? End of chapter 22. What bag? What bag? Is that where the key is? Is the key in the bag? I don't remember. Is that what she said? That the key is in the bag by the organ? It must be, yeah? That must be it. I'm going with it. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. That sort of thing ain't my bag, baby. <laughs> okay, so this one, very short chapter. We have Raoul and our Persian friend, who I still don't think we have a name for, but they are trapped in the torture chamber and they can hear Christine and Eric on the other side. Um, Eric basically says, like, if you don't marry me, um, I will kill everybody. It's up to you. And so then he leaves the room and they're able to talk to Christine. And Christine says, like, I can't help you. I'm, you know, bound because I tried to end my life. And so, like, Eric tied me up. And, like, I'm allowed to, like, end my life at 11 p.m. tomorrow. And they're like, okay, well, sugar baby sweetheart, you need to get out of these bonds and get us out of here. And she's like, well, I can't do that because I'm bound up. You need to leave. And they're like, we're in the torture chamber, sweetie. We can't leave. Um, and so they're like, Christine, he loves you. Say that you're in pain. He'll let you go. Um, and Christine knows where the door is to the torture chamber from the room that she's in and knows that the key is by the organ. So this is her, like, secret agent man task. <laughs> and so she does convince Eric that she is in pain and to unbound her, un unbind her. And she has, like, marks on her wrist and Eric is like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. You're the love of my life and I've hurt you. That's, that's death enough. Death enough. That's enough for requiring death whatever he says and he's like oh i must whisk myself away and to the organ and so he like goes and starts playing and singing which eric is a very dramatic fellow i must say but i guess that's what happens when you live in the opera oh he's never given a proper name that's terrible he's just always the persian he should definitely have an actual name, but that's fine. It's fine. Theater kids, am I right? <laughs> definitely. <laughs> I'm sorry for being insane. Does that mean that I should go into stop? Of course not. Absolutely not. <laughs> Did you touch my bag? Because um, that's my bag. It's not your bag. And you've touched it. Christine. <laughs> All right. Oh, this one's also short. There must be, like, a super long chapter coming up. There must be. Chapter 23, dude, where's my bag? <laughs> mm. Okay. Chapter 23. Oh! The tortures begin. Excuse me? The Persian's narrative continued. The voice repeated angrily, What have you done with my bag? So it was... To take my bag that you asked me to release you. 
we heard hurried steps, Christine running back to the Louis-Philippe room, as though to seek shelter on the other side of our wall. "'What are you running away for?' asked the furious voice, which had followed her. "'Give me back my bag, will you? Don't you know that it is the bag of life and death?' "'Listen to me, Eric,' sighed the girl. "'As it is settled that we are to live together, what difference can it make to you?' "'You know there are only two keys in it,' said the monster. "'Why do you, what do you want to do?' "'I want to look at this room, which I have never seen, and which you have always kept from me. "'It's a woman's curiosity,' she said, in a tone which she tried to render playful. "'But the trick was too childish for Eric to be taken in by it. "'I don't like curious women,' he retorted. And you had better remember the story of Bluebeard and be careful. Come, give me back my bag. Give me back my bag. Leave the key alone, will you, you inquisitive little thing? And he chuckled, while Christine gave a little cry of pain. Eric had evidently recovered the bag from her. At that moment, the Viscount could not help uttering an exclamation of impotent rage. "'Why, what's that?' said the monster. "'Did you hear, Christine?' "'No, no,' replied the poor girl. "'I heard nothing.' "'I thought I heard a cry. "'A cry? Are you going mad, Eric? "'Whom do you expect to give a cry in this house? "'I cried out, because you heard me. "'I heard nothing.' "'Don't like the way you said that.' <laughs> "'What? <laughs> You're trembling. You're quite excited.' You're lying. That was a cry. There was a cry. There is someone in the torture chamber. I understand now. There is no one there, Eric. I understand. No one. The man you want to marry, perhaps. I don't want to marry anybody. You know that. Another nasty chuckle. Well, it won't take long to find out. Christine, my love, we need not open the door to see what is happening in the torture chamber. Would you like to see? Would you like to see? Look here. If there is someone, if there is really someone there, you will see the invisible window light up at the top, near the ceiling. We need only draw the black curtain and put out the light in there. There. That's it. Let's put out the light. You're not afraid of the dark when you're with your little husband. Wild. Your little husband. I don't like that. Then we heard Christine's voice of anguish. No, I'm frightened. I tell you, I'm afraid of the dark. I don't care about that room now. You're always frightening me, like a child, with your torture chamber. And so I became inquisitive, but I don't care about it now. Not a bit. Not a bit. And that which I feared above all things began automatically. We were suddenly flooded with light. Yes, on our side of the wall, everything seemed aglow. The Vicomte was so much taken aback that he staggered, and their angry voice roared. I told you there was someone. You see the window now? The lighted window right up there? The man behind the wall can't see it, but you shall go up the folding steps. That is what they are there for. You have often asked me to tell you, and now you know. They're there to give a peep into the torture chamber, you inquisitive little thing. What tortures? Who is being tortured? Eric, Eric, are you only trying to frighten me? Say it if you love me, Eric. There are no tortures, are there? Go and look at the window, at the little window, dear. The size of my husband is none of your business. <laughs> I do not know if the Viscount heard the girl's swooning voice, for he was too much occupied by the astounding spectacle that now appeared before his distracted gaze. As for me, I had seen that sight too often through the little window, at the time of the rosy hours of Mazenderin, and I cared only for what was being said next door, seeking for a hint how to act, what resolution to take. Go and peep through the little window. Tell me what he looks like. 
we heard the steps being dragged against the wall. Up, up with you. No, no, I will not go up myself, dear. Very well, I will go up. Let me go. Oh, my darling, my darling, how sweet of you. How nice of you to save the, the exertion of my age. Tell me what he looks like. At that moment, we distinctly heard these words above our head. There is no one, dear. No one? Are you sure there is no one? Why, of course not. No one. Well, that's all right. What's the matter, Christine? You're not going to faint, are you? As there is no one there. Here, come down. There. Put yourself together. As there is no one there. But how do you like the landscape? Oh, very much. There, that's better. You're better now, are you not? It's all right, you're better. No excitement. What a funny house, isn't it, with the landscapes like that in there? Yes, it is like the Musée Graven. But, I say, Eric, there are no tortures in there. What a fright you gave me. Why? As there is no one there? Did you design that room? It's very handsome. You're a great artist, Eric. Yes, a great artist in my own line. But tell me, Eric, why did you call that room the torture chamber? Oh, it is very simple. First of all, what did you see? What I saw a forest. And what is in a forest? Trees. And what is in a tree? Birds. Did you see any birds? No, I did not see any birds. Well, what did you see? Think, you saw branches. What are the branches? Asked the terrible voice. There's a gibbet. That is why I call my... That is why I call... What? <laughs> that is why I call my wood the torture chamber. You see, it's all a joke. I never express myself like other people. But I am very tired of it. I'm sick and tired of having a forest and a torture chamber in my house and of living like a Montblanc in a house with a false bottom. I'm tired of it. I want to have a nice, quiet flat with ordinary doors and windows and a wife inside it like everybody else. A wife whom I could love and take out on Sunday and keep amused on weekdays. Here, shall I show you some card tricks? How did we go from torture chamber... To, to now being like, let me show you some card tricks. Oh boy, alright. That will help us pass a few minutes, while waiting for eleven o'clock tomorrow evening. My dear little Christine, are you listening to me? Tell me you love me. No, you don't love me. But no matter. You will. Once, you could not look at my mask because you knew what was behind and now you don't mind looking at it, and you forget what is behind. One can get used to everything, if one wishes. Plenty of young people who did not care for each other before marriage have adored each other since. Oh, I don't know what I'm talking about. But you would have lots of fun with me. For instance, I am the greatest ventriloquist that ever lived. I am the first ventriloquist in the world. You're laughing. Perhaps you don't believe me. Listen. Okay, so Eric is just full of talents. Um, you got your card tricks. You got your excellent, um, naming of bags and rooms. Um, he's a ventriloquist. The first in the world. All very impressive. All very impressive. Eric, my guy, you need help. <sighs> the wretch, who really was the first ventriloquist in the world, was only trying to divert the child's attention from the torture chamber. But it was a stupid scheme, for Christine thought of nothing but us. She repeatedly besought him in the gentlest tones which she could assume. Put out the light in the little window. Eric, 
do put out the light in the little window for she saw that this light which appeared so suddenly and of which the monster had spoken in so threatening a voice must mean something terrible one thing must have pacified her for a moment and that was seeing the two of us behind the wall in the midst of that resplendent light alive and well but she would certainly have felt much easier if the light had been put out meantime the other had already begun to play the ventriloquist he said here i raise my mask a little oh only a little you see my lips such lips as i have they're not moving my mouth is closed such mouth as i have and yet you hear my voice where will you have it in your left ear in your right ear in the table in those little ebony boxes on the mantelpiece listen dear it's in the little box on the right of the mantelpiece what does it say shall i turn the scorpion and now crack what does it say in the little box on the left shall i turn the grasshopper and now crack here it is in the little leather bag what does it say i am the little bag of life and death now crack it's in carlotta's throat in carlotta's golden throat in carlotta's crystal throat as i live and what does it say it says it's i mr toad it's i singing i feel without alarm quack with its melody and wind me quack and crack it's on a chair in the ghost box and it says madame carlotta is singing tonight to bring the chandelier down and now crack aha where is Eric's voice now listen christine darling listen it is behind the door of the torture chamber listen it's myself in the torture chamber and what do i say i say woe to them that have a nose a real nose and come to look round the torture chamber and then i guess there's a laugh <laughs> i'm guessing that's what it's supposed to be <laughs> it's like ah ha ah ha ah ha first as in the top rated ventriloquist or first like he invented ventriloquy either way weird flex bro we don't care eric you're insane <laughs> <laughs> here it is in Raoul's butt here it is on the moon <laughs> here it is in hell <laughs> I think Eric's cheese may have slid off his cracker <laughs> I love that saying I don't know if you made it up but I love that saying and will absolutely be saying that again I think your cheese slid off the cracker <laughs> I love it Oh, the ventriloquist's terrible voice. It was everywhere. Everywhere. It passed through the little invisible window, through the walls. It ran around us, between us. Eric was there, speaking to us. We made a movement as though to fling upon, to fling ourselves upon him. But already, swifter, more fleeting than the voice of the echo, Eric's voice had leaped back behind the wall. Soon we heard nothing more at all, for this is what happened. Eric, Eric, said Christine's voice, you tire me with your voice. Don't go on, Eric. Isn't it very hot here? Oh, yes, replied Eric's voice. The heat is unendurable. But what does this mean? The wall is getting quite hot. The wall is burning. I'll tell you, Christine, dear. It is because of the forest next door. Well... What has that to do with it, the forest? Why, didn't you see that it was an African forest? And the monster laughed so loudly and hideously that we could no longer distinguish Christine's supplicating cries. The Vicomte shouted and banged against the walls like a madman. I could not restrain him, but we heard nothing except the monster's laughter, and the monster himself can have heard nothing else. And then there was a the sound of a body falling on the floor and being dragged along, and a door slammed, and then nothing. Nothing more around us save the scorching silence of the south 
in the heart of a tropical forest. End of chapter 23. Okay, so he comes back into the room and oh no, he was already back. Christine took the bag and he's like, my bag! My bag of life and death! And she's, she like does her wiles, I guess. I don't know. And uh, he's like, oh, is there somebody in there? And she's like, no, like, why would somebody be in there? And he's like, is it your little husband? And she's like, no, absolutely not. Mm, never. And he's like, all right, well, go up there and flip the little switch. Go on. If somebody's in there, we'll be able to see. And so she, like, goes up there after, like, arguing with Eric for a little bit. She goes up there, she flips the switch, and she does see them. They can't see her, though. And all of the lights in the torture chamber go on. And Eric is like, see, the lights wouldn't have gone on if nobody was in there. And Christine's like, I didn't see anybody. And he's like, oh, that's weird. And so then she's like, well, why do you call it the torture chamber? It's so beautiful. And he's like, yeah, like, what did you see? And she's like, well, a forest. And he's like, Margaret, well, what's in a forest? And she's like, a trees. And he's like, all right, well, <laughs> what's in a tree? And she's like, birds. And he's like, well, did you see any birds? And she's like, no. And then he's like, hey, I'm really good at being a ventriloquist. I'm the first in the world. Want to see this? And she's like, okay. <laughs> and every once in a while, she tries to, like, insert to be like, shouldn't we turn the light off? It's, like, a little weird, right? um and she's like trying to gently be like shouldn't we turn the light off like it's a little weird and he's doing this weird ventriloquism ventriloquism thing but in doing that we find out that he was the one who made carlotta have that weird like croaking sound when she was performing um and yeah then Christine is like, it's a little toasty in here, isn't it? And he's like, oh, is it? Is it getting warm? And she's like, yeah. And, like, the wall is, like, burning. And he's like, didn't you know that the forest was an African forest? <laughs> and so it's getting, like, super, super hot in the torture room. Which just reminds me of, like, like, when you're, like, heating up, like, a, I mean, I don't do this. This is not a personal me thing that I do. But, like, when you put a frog in water and then you slowly heat it up. And they don't realize, the frog doesn't realize that it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter and being cooked. Versus, like, just being thrown into something really hot. That's what it feels like. All right. <laughs> Mood boils frogs. Confirmed. I'm not an expert, but... Ventriloquism is not magic. <laughs> what? <laughs> Chapter 24. Barrels. Barrels. Any barrels to sell? That is literally the chapter name. <laughs> the Persian's narrative continued. I have said that the room in which Monsieur and I were imprisoned was a regular hexagon, lined entirely with mirrors. Plenty of these rooms have been seen since, mainly at ex exhibitions. They are called Palaces of Illusion, or some such name. But the invention belongs entirely to Eric, who built the first room of this kind under my eyes at the time of the rosy hours of Mazenderan, Mazenderan. A decorative object, such as a column, for instance, was placed in one of the quarters and immediately produced a hall of a thousand columns. For, thanks to the mirrors, the real room was multiplied by six hexagonal, hexagonal, hexagonal rooms, each of which, in its turn, were multiplied indefinitely. But the little sultana soon tired of this infantile illusion, whereupon Eric altered his invention into a torture chamber. For the architectural motive placed in one corner, his substitu he substituted an iron tree. This tree, with its painted leaves, 
were absolutely true to life, and was made of iron so as to resist all the attacks of the patient who was locked in the torture chamber. We shall see how the scene thus obtained was twice altered instantaneously into two successive other scenes by means of the automatic rotation of the drums or rollers in the corners. These were divided into three sections, fitting into the angles of the mirrors and each supporting a decorative scheme that came into sight as the roller revolved upon its axis. The walls of this strange room gave the patient nothing to lay hold of, because, apart from the solid decorative object, they were simply furnished with mirrors, thick enough to withstand any onslaught of the victim who was flung into the chamber empty-handed and barefoot. There was no furniture. The ceiling was capable of being lit up, an ingenious system of electric heating, which has since been imitated, allowed the temperature of the walls and room to be increased at will. I am giving all these details of a perfectly natural invention, producing, with a few painted brushes, the supernatural illusion of an equatorial forest blazing under the tropical sun, so that one so that no one may doubt the present balance of my brain, or feel entitled to say that I am mad, or lying, or that I take him for a fool. We have a footnote, and it says, It is very natural that, at the time when the Persian was writing, he should take so many precautions against any spirit of incredulity on the part of those who were likely to read his narrative. Nowadays, when we have all seen this sort of room, his precautions would be superfluous. I now return to the facts where I left them. When the ceiling lit up and the forest became visible around us, the Viscount's stupe stupefaction was immense. That impenetrable forest, with its innumerable trunks and branches, threw him into a terrible state of consternation. He passed his hand over his forehead, as though to drive away a dream. His eyes blinked, and for a moment he forgot to listen. I have already said that the sight of the forest did not surprise me at all, and therefore I listened for the two of us to what was happening next door. Lastly, my attention was especially attracted, not so much to the scene as to the mirrors that produced it. These mirrors were broken in parts. Yes, they marked and scratched. They had been starred in spite of their solid solidity. And this proved to me that the torture chamber in which we now were had already served a purpose. Yes, some wretch, whose feet were not bare like those of the victims of the rosy hours, had certainly fallen into this mortal illusion, and mad with rage, had kicked against those mirrors which, nevertheless, continued to reflect his agony and the branch of the tree on which he had put an end to his own suffering was arranged in such a way that, before dying, he had seen, for his last consolation, a thousand men writhing in his company. Yes, Joseph Bouquet had undoubtedly been through all this. Were we to die as he had done? I did not think so for I knew that we had a few hours before us and that I could employ them to better purpose than Joseph Bouquet was able to do. After all, I was thoroughly acquainted with most of Eric's tricks, and now or never was the time to turn my knowledge to account. To begin with, I gave up every idea of returning to the passage that had brought us to that accursed chamber. I did not trouble about the possibility of working the inside stone that closed the passage, and this for the simple reason that to do so was out of the question. We had dropped from too great a height into the torture chamber, not even the branch of the iron tree, not even each each other each other's shoulders were of an avail, any avail. There was only one possible outlet that opening into the Louis Philippe room in which Eric and Christine were. But, though this outlet looked like an ordinary door on Christine's side, it was absolutely invisible to us. We must therefore try to open it 
without even knowing where it is. When I was quite sure that there was no hope for us from Christine's side, when I had heard the monster dragging the poor girl from the Louis Philippe room, lest she should interfere with our tortures, I resolved to set to work without delay. But I had first to calm Monsieur, who was already walking about like a madman, uttering incoherent cries. The snatches of conversation which he had caught between Christine and the monster had contributed not a little to drive him beside himself. Add to that the shock of the magic forest and the scorching heat which was beginning to make the perspiration stream down his temples, and you will have no difficulty in understanding his state of mind. He shouted Christine's name, brandished his pistol, knocked his forehead against the glass in his endeavors to run down the glades of the elusive forest. In short, the torture was beginning to work its spell upon a brain unprepared for it. I did my best to induce the poor Viscount to listen to reason. I made him touch the mirrors and the iron tree and the branches and explain to him, by optical laws, all the luminous imagery by which we were surrounded and of which we need not allow ourselves to be the victims, like ordinary, ignorant people. We are in a room. A little room, that is what you must keep saying to yourself, and we shall leave the room as soon as we have found the door. And I promised him that, if he let me act without disturbing me by shouting and walking up and down, I would discover the trick of the door in less than an hour's time. Then he lay flat on the floor, as one does in a wood, and declared that he would wait until I found the door of the forest, as there was nothing better to do. And he added that, from where he was, the view was splendid. The torture was working, in spite of all that I had said. Myself, forgetting the forest, I tackled a glass panel and began to finger it in every direction, hunting for the weak point on which to press it in order to turn the door in accordance with Eric's system of pivots. This weak point might be a mere speck on the glass, no larger than a pea, under which the spring lay hidden. I hunted and hunted. I felt as high as my hands could reach. Eric was about the same height as myself, and I thought that we would not have placed the spring higher than suited, than suited his stature. While groping over the successive panels with the greatest care, I endeavored not to lose a minute, for I was feeling more and more overcome with the heat, and we were literally roasting in that blazing fire. I had been working like this for half an hour, and had finished three panels when, as ill luck would have it, I turned round on hearing a muttered exclamation from the Viscount. "'I'm stifling,' he said. "'All those mirrors are sending me out in infernal heat. Do you think you will find that spring soon? If we are much longer about it, we shall be roasted alive.' I was not sorry to hear him talk like this. He had not said a word for the for he had not said a word of the forest, and I hoped that my companion's reason would hold out some time longer against the torture. But he added, What consoles me is that the monster had given Christine until eleven tomorrow evening. If we can't get out of here and go to her assistance, at least we shall be dead before her. Then Eric's mass can serve for all of us and he gulped down a breath of hot air that nearly made him faint. As I had not the same desperate reasons as Monsieur for accepting death, I returned, after giving him a word of encouragement, to my panel, but I had made the mistake of taking a few steps while speaking, and, in the tangle of the elusive forest, I was no longer able to find my pa panel for certain. I had to begin all over again, at random, feeling, fumbling, Too bad Raoul can't just leaf the forest. I bet it would raise his spirits. Terrible. <laughs> now the fever laid hold on me of me in my turn. Now the fever laid hold of me in my turn, for I found nothing, absolutely nothing. In the next room, all was silence. We were quite lost in the forest without an outlet, a compass, a guide, or anything. 
Oh, I knew what awaited us if nobody came to our aid, or if I did not find the spring. But, look as I might, I found nothing but branches. Beautiful branches that stood straight up before me, or spread gracefully over my head. But they gave no shade. And this was natural enough, as we were in an equatorial forest, with the sun right above our heads, an African forest. Monsieur and I had repeatedly taken off our coats and put them on again, finding at one time that they made us feel still hotter, and at another that they protected us against the heat. I was still making a moral resistance, but Monsieur seemed to me quite gone. He pretended that he had been walking in the forest for three days and nights without stopping, looking for Christine. From time to time, he thought he saw her behind the trunk of a tree or gliding between the branches, and he called to her with words of supplication that brought the tears to my eyes. And then, at last, "'Oh, how thirsty I am!' he cried in delirious accents. I, too, was thirsty. My throat was on fire. And yet, squatting on the floor, I went on hunting, hunting, hunting for the spring of the invisible door, especially as it was dangerous to remain in the forest as evening drew nigh. Already the shades of night were, be were beginning to surround us. It had happened very quickly. Night falls quickly in tropical countries, suddenly, with hardly any twilight. Hardly any twilight. Speaking of twilight, this part, this part of the story is very intriguing. <laughs> Terrible. Now, night in the forest of the equator is always dangerous, particularly when, like ourselves, one has not the materials for a to keep off the beasts of prey. I did indeed try for a moment to break off the branches, which I would have lit with my dark lantern, but I knocked myself also against the mirrors and remembered, in time, that we had only images of branches to do with. The heat did not go with the daylight. On the contrary, it was now still hotter under the blue rays of the moon. I urged the Viscount to hold our weapons ready to fire and not to stray from camp while I went on looking for my spring. Suddenly, we heard a lion roaring a few yards away. Oh, whispered the Viscount. He is quite close. Don't you see him? There, through the trees, in that thicket. If he roars again, I will fire. And the roaring began again, louder than before. And the Viscount fired, but I do not think that he hit the lion. Only... He smashed a mirror, as I perceived the next morning at daybreak. We must have covered a good distance during the night, for we suddenly found ourselves on the edge of the desert, an immense desert of sand, stones, and rocks. It was really not worth while leaving the forest to come upon the desert. Tired out, I flung myself down beside the Viscount, for I had had enough of looking for springs which I could not find. I was quite surprised, and I said so to the Viscount that we had encountered no other dangerous animals during the night. Usually, after the lion came the leopard, and sometimes the buzz of the tsetse fly? I have no idea how to say this. T-S-E T-S-E Tsetse fly? Sets. Got it. Tsetse. Tsetse. So sexy. <laughs> that feeds on human and animal blood, known primarily as a carrier of parasitic trypanosomes. Cool, so we should stay away from those. Got it. Got it. Wonder if Eric has any leaflets about this forest. Terrible. You're all terrible. <laughs> Let's see, where is that fly? Okay, usually after the lion came the leopard, and sometimes the buzz of the setsy fly. 
these were easily obtained effects and i explained to monsieur that eric imitated the roar of a lion on a long tabor or timbo with an ass's skin on one end over this skin he tied a string of catgut which was fastened at the middle to another similar string passing through the whole length of the tabor Eric had only to rub the string with a glove smeared with resin, and, according to the manner in which he rubbed it, he imitated to perfection the voice of the lion or the leopard, or even the buzzing of the set sea fly. You also found this on Google. Okay. An African blood-sucking fly which bites humans and other mammals, transmitting sleeping sickness? Indigana. I don't know what the kind is. That is terrible and terrifying that's more terrifying than anything that's happened in this book more terrifying than eric i don't like that not one little bit do i like that <laughs> the idea that eric was probably in the room beside us working his trick made me suddenly resolve to enter into a parley with him for we must obviously give up all thought of taking him by surprise and by this time he must be quite aware who were the occupants in this torture chamber. I called him, Eric, Eric. I shouted as loudly as I could across the desert, but there was no answer to my voice. All around us lay the silence and the bare immensity of that stony desert. What was to become of us in the midst of that awful solitude? We were beginning, literally, to die of heat, hunger, and thirst. Of thirst especially, at last I saw Monsieur raise himself on his elbow and point to a spot on the horizon. He had discovered an oasis. Oh my gosh, okay, more. <sighs> African mm -hmm. also called sleeping sickness is a disease caused by a parasite. People can get this parasite when they when an infected setsy fly bites them, symptoms include fatigue, high fever, headache, and muscle aches. If the disease is not treated, it can cause death. Goodness gracious, I hate that. Yes, far in the distance was an oasis. An oasis with limpid water, which reflected the iron trees. Tush. It was the scene of a mirage. I recognized it at once. The worst of the three. No one had been able to fight against it. No one. I did my utmost to keep my head, and not to hope for water, because I knew that. If a man hoped for water, the water that reflected the iron tree, and if, after hoping for water, he struck against the mirror, then there was only one thing for him to do. To hang himself on the iron tree. So I cried to Monsieur. It's a mirage. It's a mirage. Don't believe the water. It's another trick of the mirrors. Then he flatly told me to shut up with my tricks of the mirrors, my springs, my revolving doors, and my palaces of illusions. He angrily declared that I must be either blind or mad to imagine that all that water flowing over there, among those splendid numberless trees, was not real water and the desert was real, and so was the forest, and it was no use trying to take him in. He was an old, experienced traveler. He had been all over the place. And he dragged himself along, saying, Water! Water! And his mouth was open as though he were drinking, and my mouth was open too as though I were drinking. For we had not only saw the water, but we heard it. We heard it flow. We heard it ripple. Do you understand that word, ripple? It is a sound which you hear with your tongue. You put your tongue out of your mouth to listen to it better. Lastly, and this was the most pitiless torture of all, we heard the rain, and it was not raining. This was an infernal invention. Oh, I knew well enough how Eric obtained it. He filled with little stones a very long and narrow box, broken up inside with wooden and metal projections. The stones, in falling, struck against those projections and rebounded from one another. 
and the result was a series of pattering sounds that exactly imitated a rainstorm. Ah, you should have seen us putting out our tongues and dragging ourselves toward the rippling river bank. Our eyes and ears were full of water, but our tongues were hard and dry as thorn. When we reached the mirror, Monsieur licked it, and I also licked the glass. It was burning hot, and we rolled on the floor with a hoarse cry of despair. Monsieur put the one pistol that was still loaded to his temple, and I stared at the lasso at the foot of the iron tree. I knew why the iron tree had returned in this third change of scene. The iron tree was waiting for me. But, as I stared at the lasso, I saw a thing that made me start so violently that Monsieur delayed his attempt. I took his arm, and then I caught the pistol from him, and then I dragged myself on my knees toward what I had seen. I had discovered, near the lasso, a groove in the floor, a black-headed nail of which I knew the use. At last, I had discovered the spring. I felt the nail. I lifted a radiant face to Monsieur. The black-headed nail yielded to my presence. And then, and then we saw not a door opened in the wall, but a cellar flap released in the floor. Cool air came up to us from the black hole below. We stooped over that square of darkness as though over a limpid well. With our chins in the cool sh shade, we drank it in and we bent lower and lower over the trap door. What could there be in that cellar which opened before us? Water. Water to drink? I thrust my arm into the darkness and came upon a stone, and another stone. A staircase. A dark staircase leading into the cellar. The Viscount waited to fling himself down the hole, but I, fearing a new trick of the monsters, stopped him, turned on my dark lantern and went down first. The staircase was a winding one, and led down into pitchy darkness, but oh, how deliciously cool were the darkness and the stairs. The lake could not be far away. We soon reached the bottom. Our eyes were beginning to accustom themselves to the dark, to distinguish shapes around us, circular shapes, on which I turned the light of my lantern. Barrels. We were in Eric's cellar. It was here that he must keep his wine and perhaps his drinking water. I knew that Eric was a great lover of good wines. Ah, there was plenty to drink here. Monsieur petted the round shapes and kept saying, Barrels! Barrels! What a lot of barrels! Indeed, there were quite a number of barrels, symmetrically arranged in two rows, one on either side of us. They were small barrels, and I thought that Eric must have selected them of that size to facilitate their carriage to the house on the lake. We examined them successfully, to see if one of them had not a funnel, showing that it had been tapped at some time or another, but all the barrels were hermetically closed. Then, after half lifting one to make sure it was full, we went on our knees, and, with the blade of a small knife, which I carried, I prepared to stave in the bunghole. Excuse me. Even if I believe that Eric somehow managed to create an illusion that makes people believe that they wander through an African forest for an eternity, how does that work when someone looks in through that small window that was mentioned earlier? Magic. magic obviously i mean nothing is too difficult for the first ever ventriloquist at that moment i seemed to hear coming from very far a sort of monotonous chant which i knew well from often hearing it in the streets of paris barrels barrels, any barrels to sell? My hand desisted from its work. Monsieur had also heard it. He said, that's funny. 
It sounds as if the barrels are singing. The song was renewed farther away. Barrels. Barrels. Any barrels to sell? Oh, I swear, said the Viscount, that the tune dies away in the barrel. We stood up and went to look behind the barrel. It's inside, said Monsieur. It's inside. But we heard nothing there, and were driven to accuse the bad condition of our senses. And we returned to the bunghole. Monsieur put his two hands together underneath it, and, with a last effort, I burst the bung. What's this? cried the Viscount. This ain't water. The Viscount put his two full hands close to my lantern. I stooped to look, and at once threw away the lantern with such violence that it broke and went out, leaving us in utter darkness. What I had seen in Monsieur's hands was gunpowder. End of chapter 24. <laughs> Okay, chapter 24. Um, We now know that the torture chamber is really just like a house of illusions with a bunch of mirrors and settings and like effects. So they're in a forest for a really long time and they see a tree and our Persian friend is like, that's not a good sign because what that means is that we will be driven crazy to the point where we will take our own lives. Terrible. And so they're, like, wandering around, and Raoul is just, he's just lost it. He he can't be relied upon anymore. <laughs> and so our Persian friend, oh gosh, our Persian friend is trying to figure out how to get out. And in doing so, the scene has changed to a desert. And they keep going back and forth about whether or not they need to put their coat on, whether they need to take it off, blah, blah, blah. And Raoul is just freaking out just seeing visions all of these things and he sees an oasis and as he's going to the oasis our persian friend is like wait a minute this is where they get you this is the worst of the three illusions that happen and so they see water and they go up to the water and they lick the water and they actually lick the wall or the floor, one of those, but it is scorching hot to the point where Raoul wants to take his life. It is just terrible pain. And there's also the lasso there next to the tree. And uh, our Persian friend is like looking around, trying to figure something out. And he sees next to the lasso a little black nail. And he knows that that's the spring. So he pops that open they go down they're like oh my gosh it feels so good and nice and cool and there's all these barrels and they're like well of course like eric is obviously very into wine and these are filled with wine and probably water so we're gonna bust one of these bad boys open and finally get something to drink and they bust it open and our person friend sees what raul is holding and he throws the lantern it shatters goes out they're in complete darkness but raul is holding not water gunpowder his moist hands have dried out the source of all his power that's why he went crazy that's why he started seeing things absolutely <laughs> mirrors are not magic despite what raul thinks i fair <laughs> Yeah, they're visited by three spirits. <laughs> Wait a minute. Chapter 25. Let's go. Wait. Chapter 25. The scorpion or the grasshopper. Which? The Persian's narrative concluded. And, okay, this part of the story, before we, like, get back to our chapter, but this part of the story seems so vastly different in tone and just in 
anything else that has happened in the story. Like, it just almost feels like a completely different story um, with the, like, the torture room. I don't know. It just seems very disjointed. This version is way less Andrew Lloyd Webbery. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I guess after... And I haven't seen any ad adaptations, and I'm wondering if this is even in the adaptations, or if it's just like, yeah, this was weird. Let's do something totally different. Okay. Chapter 25 for real Z's. The Scorpion or the Grasshopper. Which... The Persian's narrative concluded. The discovery flung us into a state of alarm that made us forget all our past and present sufferings. We now knew all that the monster meant to convey when he said to Christine, yes or no. If your answer is no, everybody will be dead and buried. Yes, buried under the ruins of the Paris Grand Opera. The monster had given her until eleven o'clock in the evening. He had chosen his time well. There would be many people, many members of the human race up there, in the resplendent theater. What finer retinue could be expected for his funeral? He would go down to the tomb escorted by the whitest shoulders of the world, decked with the richest jewels. Eleven o'clock tomorrow evening. We were all to be blown up in the middle of the performance if Christine said no. Eleven o'clock tomorrow evening. And what else could Christine say but no? Would she not prefer to espouse death itself rather than, rather than that living corpse? She did not know that on her acceptance or refusal depended the awful fate of many members of the human race. Eleven o'clock tomorrow evening. As we dragged ourselves through the darkness, feeling our way to the stone steps, for the light in the trapdoor overhead that led to the room of the mirrors was now distinguished, and we repeated to ourselves, Eleven o'clock tomorrow evening. At last I found the stairs, but suddenly I drew myself up on the first step, for a terrible thought had come to my mind. What's the time? Ah, what was the time? For, after all, eleven o'clock tomorrow evening might be now, might be this very moment. Who could tell us the time? We seem to have been imprisoned in that hell for days and days, for years, since the beginning of the world. Perhaps we should be blown up then and there. A sound. A crack. Did you hear that? There, in the corner. Good heavens, like a sound of machinery. Again. Oh, for the light. Perhaps it's the machinery that is to blow everything up. I tell you, a cracking sound. Are you deaf? Monsieur and I began to yell like madmen. Fear spurned us on. We rushed up the treads of the staircase, stumbling as we went. Anything to escape the dark, to return to the mortal light of the room of mirrors. That's exactly why you were told that Eric's parties are always a blast. Terrible. Terrible. We found the trapdoor still open, but it was now as dark in the room of mirrors as in the cellar which we had left. We dragged ourselves along the floor of the torture chamber, the floor that separated us from the powder magazine. What was the time? We shouted. We called Monsieur to Christine, I to Eric, I reminded him that I had saved his life, but no answer, save that of our despair, of our madness. What was the time? We argued. We tried to calculate the time which we had spent there, but we were incapable of reasoning. If only we could see the face of a watch. Mine had stopped, but Monsieur was still going. He told me that he had wound it up before dressing for the opera. We had not a match upon us, and yet we must know. Monsieur 
broke the glass of his watch and felt the two hands. He questioned the hands of the watch with his two fingertips, going by the position of the ring of the watch. Judging by the space between the hands, he thought it might be just eleven o'clock. But perhaps it was not eleven o'clock of which we stood in dread. Perhaps we still had twelve hours before us. Suddenly I exclaimed, Hush! I seemed to hear footsteps in the next room. Someone tapped against the wall. Christine's voice said, Raoul? Raoul? We were now all talking at once, on either side of the wall. Christine sobbed. She was not sure that she would find Monsieur alive. The monster had been terrible, it seemed, had done nothing but rave, waiting for her to give him the yes, which she refused. And yet she had promised him that yes, if he would take her to the torture chamber. But he had obstinately declined, and had uttered hideous threats against all the members of the human race. At last— after hours and hours of that hell, he had that moment gone out, leaving her alone to reflect for the last time. Hours and hours. What is the time now? What is the time, Christine? It's eleven o'clock. Eleven o'clock, all but five minutes. But which eleven o'clock? The eleven o'clock that is to decide life or death. He told me so just before he went out. He is terrible. He is quite mad. He tore off his mask, and his yellow eyes shot flames. He did nothing but laugh. He said, I give you five minutes to spare your blushes. He here, he said, taking a key from the little bag of life and death, here is the little bronze key that opens the two ebony caskets on the mantelpiece in the Louis Philippe room. In one of the caskets, you will find a scorpion, in the other, a grasshopper, both very cleverly imitated in Japanese bronze. You will say yes or no for you, or they will say yes or no for you. If you turn the scorpion round, that will mean to me, when I return, that you have said yes. The grasshopper will mean no. And he laughed like a drunken demon. I did nothing but beg and entreat him to give me the key of the torture chamber, promising to be his wife if he granted me that request. But he told me that there was no future need for that key, and that he was going to throw it into the lake. And he said he again laughed like a drunken demon and left me. Oh, his last words were, the grasshopper. Be careful of the grasshopper. A grasshopper does not only turn, it hops, it hops, it hops jolly high. The five minutes had nearly elapsed, and the scorpion and the grasshopper were scratching at my brain. Nevertheless, I had sufficient lucidity left to understand that if the grasshopper were turned, it would hop, and with it many members of the human race. There is no doubt but that the grasshopper controlled an electric current intended to blow up the magazine. Monsieur, who seemed to have recovered all his moral force from hearing Christine's voice explained to her, in a few hurried words, the situation in which we and all the opera were. He told her to turn the scorpion at once. There was a pause. Christine, I cried, where are you? by the scorpion. Don't touch it. The idea had come to me, for I knew, my Eric, that the monster had perhaps perceived the girl once more. Oops, perceived. Deceived the girl once more. Perhaps it was the scorpion that would blow everything up. After all, why wasn't he there? The five minutes were long past, and he was not back. Perhaps he had taken shelter and was waiting for the explosion. Why had he not returned? He could not really expect Christine ever to consent to become his voluntary prey. Why had he not returned? Don't touch the scorpion, I said. Here he comes, cried Christine. I hear him. Here he is. We heard his steps approaching the Louis Philippe room. He came up to Christine, but did not speak. Then I raised my voice. Eric, it is I. 
Do you know me? With extraordinary calmness, he at once replied. So, you are not dead in there. Well then, see that you keep quiet. I tried to speak, but he said coldly, Not a word, or I shall blow everything up. And he added, The honor rests with Mademoiselle. Mademoiselle has not touched the scorpion. How deliberately he spoke. Mademoiselle has not touched the grasshopper. With that composure. But it is not too late to do the right thing. There, I open the caskets without a key, and I am a trapdoor lover, and I open and shut what, a, what I please and as I please. I open the little ebony caskets, mademoiselle. Look at the little dears inside. Aren't they pretty? If you turn the grasshopper, mademoiselle, we shall all be blown up. There is enough gunpowder under our feet to blow up a whole quarter of Paris. If you turn the scorpion, mademoiselle, all that powder will be soaked and drowned. Mademoiselle, to celebrate our wedding, you shall make a very handsome present to a few hundred Parisians who are at this moment applauding a poor masterpiece of Meyerbeer's. You shall make them a present of their lives. For with your own fair hands you shall turn the scorpion, and merrily, merrily, we will be married. A pause, and then, if in two minutes, mademoiselle, you have not turned the scorpion, I shall turn the grasshopper, and the grasshopper, I tell you, hops jolly high. The terrible silence began anew. The Vicomte, realizing that there was nothing left to do but pray, went down on his knees and prayed. As for me, my blood beat so fiercely that I had to take my heart in both hands, lest it should burst. At last we heard Eric's voice. The two minutes are past. Goodbye, mademoiselle. Hop, grasshopper. Eric! cried Christine. Do you swear to me, monster? Do you swear to me that the scorpion is the one to turn? Yes, to hop at our wedding. Ah, you see, you said hop at our wedding, ingenious child. The scorpion opens the ball, but that will do. You won't have the scorpion. Then I turn the grasshopper. Eric, enough. I was crying out in concert with Christine. Monsieur was still on his knees praying. Eric, I have turned the grasshopper. Oh, the second through which we passed. Waiting. Waiting to find ourselves in fragments amid the roar of the ruins. Turning a scorpion is not legally binding. Just do it and say no. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> It's definitely not legally binding. The stakes are not quite as high to turn the scorpion. Feeling something crack beneath our feet. Hearing an appalling hiss through the open trapdoor. A hiss like the first sound of a rocket. It came softly at first, then louder then very loud, but it was not the hiss of fire. It was more like the hiss of water, and now it became a gurgling sound. We rushed to the trapdoor. All our thirst, which vanished when the terror came, now returned with the lapping of the water. The water rose in the cellar, above the barrels, the powder barrels. Barrels, barrels, any barrels to sell and we went down to it with parched throats. It rose to our shin, to our chins, to our mouths, and we drank. We stood on the floor of the cellar and drank, and we went up the stairs again in the dark, step by step, went up with the water. The water came out of the cellar with us and spread over the floor of the room. If this went on, the whole house on the lake would be swamped. The floor of the torture chamber had itself become a regular little lake in which our feet splashed. Surely there was enough water now. Eric must turn off the tap. 
Eric. Eric. That is water enough for the gunpowder. Turn off the tap. Turn off the scorpion. But Eric did not reply. We heard nothing but the water rising. It was halfway to our waists. Christine, cried Monsieur. Christine, the water is up to our knees. But Christine did not reply. We heard nothing but the rising water. No one. No one in the next room. No one to turn the tap. No one to turn the scorpion. We were all alone in the dark, with the dark water that seized us and clasped us and froze us. Eric? Christine? By this time we had lost our foothold and were spinning around in the water, carried away by, by an irresistible whirl, for the water turned with us and dashed us against the dark mirror which thrust us back again, and our throats, raised above the whirlpool, roared aloud. Were we to die here, drowned in the torture chamber? I had never seen that. Eric, at the time of the rosy hours, had never shown me that through the invisible window. Eric, I cried, I saved your life. Remember, you were sentenced to death, but for me, you would be dead now. Eric? We whirled around in the water like so much wreckage, but suddenly my straying hands seized the trunk of the iron tree. I called Monsieur, and we both hung to the branch of the iron tree, and the water rose still higher. Oh, can you remember how much space is there between the branch of the tree and the dome-shaped ceiling? Do try to remember. After all, the water may stop. It must find its level. There, I think it's stopping. No, no, oh, horrible. Swim, swim for your life. Our arms became entangled in the effort of swimming. We choked. We fought in the dark water. Already we could barely breathe. The dark air above the dark water, the air which escaped, which we could hear escaping through some vent hole or other. Oh, let us turn and turn and turn until we find the air hole and then glue our mouths to it. But I lost my strength. I tried to lay hold of the walls. Oh, how those glass walls slipped from under my groping fingers. We whirled around again. We began to sink. One last effort. A last cry. Eric. Christine. In our ears. At the bottom of the dark water, our ears went. And before losing consciousness entirely, I seemed to hear between two goggles. Barrels. Barrels. Any barrels to sell? End of chapter 25. Ooh, okay, so this chapter. Um, they go black up they go back up into the torture chamber, and Christine is there alone. And they're like, Christine, girl, what is happening? You have to get us out. And Christine is like, Well, they don't know what time it is, because they have realized that at 11 o'clock, when Christine needs to make her choice, if she chooses no, the gunpowder is going to be used to explode the theater. And everybody in the theater will die. And at 11 p.m. is when there will be a packed theater. So they go up there. They try to figure out what time it is. They realize it is 11 o'clock. And they're like, okay, but like, which, which 11? Do we have 12 hours? So they go upstairs into the torture chamber and Christine is there and they're like, Christine, what time is it? Is it? And she's like, oh, it's 11 o'clock, five minutes till. And they're like, okay, but like, which 11 o'clock? And she's like, the dead one, like the one that I need to make my decision. And she, she explains to them that Eric has left her to decide if she chooses the grasshopper if she turns the grasshopper that means no and if she turns the scorpion that that means that she will marry eric um 
Eric does come back after quite some time and they have a discussion and Christine decides to turn the scorpion with the knowledge that Raul and uh, our Persian friend have relayed about what would happen. And so she turns the scorpion and they hear water coming from the cellar underneath and they go over there and the water is rising and rising and rising and it covers all of the gunpowder, rendering it useless, which is a good thing. And it keeps rising and they go over there and they're like drinking from the water and they're like going up the steps to back to the torture chamber, drinking the water and it keeps going and it keeps going. And they're like, okay, you can, you can stop. Like the water did what it was supposed to do, but it keeps going and they're yelling to Eric they're yelling to Christine and nobody's answering nobody is there and the water keeps rising and rising and rising and rising and so they're like swimming and they hold on to one of the the trees and they think it stopped but it keeps going and it keeps gurgling and they're hearing it in their ears now and they're they hear something like a vent and they're like okay well we need to find this vent and we need to like glue our like faces to it so that we can breathe from this vent and that's where the chapter ended um will they survive i don't know (laughs) i really can't tell you so that's cool That's cool. All right, let's continue on. Chapter 26, the end of the ghost's love story. The previous chapter marks the conclusion of the written narrative which the Persian left behind him. Notwithstanding the horrors of the situation which which seemed definitely to abandon them to their deaths, Monsieur and his companion were saved by the sublime devotion of Christine, and I had the rest of the story from the lips of the Persian himself. When I went to see him, he was still living in his little flat in the Rue de Rivoli, opposite the Tuileries. He was very ill, and it required all my ardor as an historian pledged to the truth to persuade him to live the incredible tragedy over again for my benefit. His faithful old servant, Darius, showed me into him. The Persian received me at a window overlooking the garden of the Tuileries. He still had his magnificent eyes, but his poor face looked very worn. He had shaved the whole of his head, which was usually covered with an astrakhan cap. He was dressed in a long, plain coat, and amused himself by unconsciously twisting his thumbs inside the sleeves. But his mind was quite clear, and he told me his story with perfect lucidity. It seemed that, when he opened his eyes, the Persian found himself lying on a bed. Monsieur was on a sofa, beside the wardrobe. An angel and a devil were watching over them. After the deceptions and delusions of the torture chamber, the precision of the details of that quiet little middle-class room seemed to have been invented for the express purpose of puzzling the mind of the mortal rash enough to stray into that abode of living nightmare. The wooden bedstead, the waxed mahogany chairs, the chest of drawers, those brasses, the little square antimacid, Macassars, carefully placed on the backs of the chairs, the clock on the mantelpiece, and the harmless-looking ebony caskets at either end. Lastly, the whatnot filled with shells, with red pincushions, with mother-of-pearl boats, and an enormous ostrich egg, the whole discreetly lighted by a shaded lamp standing on a small, round table. This collection of ugly, peaceable, reasonable furniture at the bottom of the opera cellars bewildered the imagination more than all the late fantastic happenings and the future of the masked man seemed all the more formidable in this old-fashioned neat and trim little frame 
it bent down over the Persian and said in his ear, Are you better? Are you looking at my furniture? It is all that I have left of my poor, unhappy mother. Christine did not say a word. She moved about noiselessly, like a sister of charity, who had taken a vow of silence. She brought a cup of cordial, or of hot tea, he did not remember which. The man in the mask took it from her hands and gave it to the Persian. Monsieur was still sleeping. Eric poured a drop of rum into the Persian's cup and, pointing to the Viscount, said, He came to himself long before we knew if you were still alive. He is quite well. He is asleep. We must not wake him. Eric left the room for a moment, and the Persian raised himself on his elbow, looked around him and saw Christine Day sitting by the fireside. He spoke to her, called her, but he was still very weak and fell back on his pillow. Christine came to him, laid her hand on his forehead, and went away again. And the Persian remembered that, as she went, she did not give a glance at Monsieur, who, it is true, was sleeping peacefully. And she sat down again in her chair by the chimney corner, silent as a sister of charity who had taken a vow of silence. Eric returned with some little bottles which he placed on the mantelpiece, and, again in a whisper, so as not to wake Monsieur, he said to the Persian, after sitting down and feeling his pulse, You are now saved, both of you, and soon I shall take you up to the surface of the earth, to please my wife. Thereupon he rose, without any further explanation, and disappeared once more. The Persian now looked at Christine's quiet profile under the lamp. She was reading a tiny book with gilt edges, like a religious book. There are editions of The Imitation that look like that. The Persian still had in his ears the natural tone in which the other had said, To please my wife. Very gently, he called her again, but Christine was wrapped up in her book and did not hear him. Eric returned, mixed the Persian a draft, and advised him not to speak to his wife again, nor to anyone, because it might be very dangerous to everybody's health. Eventually, the Persian fell asleep, like Monsieur, and did not wake until he was in his own room, nursed by his faithful Darius, who told him that, on the night before, he was found propped against the door of his flat, where he had been brought by a stranger, who rang the bell before going away. <laughs> this was the first and last time Eric was ever able to please his wife. <laughs> as soon as the Persian recovered his strength and his wits, he sent to Count Felipe's house to inquire after the Viscount's health. The answer was that the young man had not been seen, and that Count and that Count Felipe was dead. His body was found on the bank of the Opera Lake on the Rue Scribe side. The Persian remembered the Requiem Mass, which he had heard from behind the wall of the torture chamber, and had no doubt concerning the crime and the criminal. Knowing Eric as he did, he easily reconstructed the tragedy. Thinking that his brother had run away with Christine, Felipe had dashed in pursuit of him along the Brussels road, where he knew that everything was prepared for the elopement. Failing to find the pair, he hurried back to the opera, remembered Raoul's strange confidence about his fantastic rival, and learned that the Viscount had made every effort to enter the cellars of the theatre, and that he had disappeared, leaving his hat in the prima donna's dressing room beside an empty pistol case. Uh-oh. And the Count, who no longer entertained any doubt of his brother's madness, in his turn, darted into that infernal underground maze. This was enough, in the Persian's eyes, to explain the discovery of the Comte de Chagny's corpse on the shore of the lake, where the siren, 
Eric's siren kept watch. The Persian did not hesitate. He determined to inform the police. Now the case was in, was in the hands of an examining magistrate called Fair, an incredulous, commonplace, superficial sort of person. I write, as I think, with a mind utterly unprepared to receive a confidence of this kind. Monsieur Fair took down the took down the Persian's dispositions and proceeded to treat him as a madman. Despairing of ever obtaining a hearing, the Persian sat down to write. As the police did not want his evidence, perhaps the press would be glad of it. And he had just written the last line of the narrative I have quoted in the preceding chapters, when Darius announced the visit of a stranger who refused his name, who would not show his face, and declared simply that he did not intend to leave the place until he had spoken to the Persian. The Persian at once felt who his singular visitor was, and ordered him to be shown in. He was right. It was the ghost. It was Eric. He looked extremely weak and leaned against the wall as though he were afraid of falling. Taking off his hat, he revealed a forehead wa white as wax. The rest of the horrible face was hidden by the mask. The Persian rose to his feet as Eric entered murderer of Count Felipe. What have you done with his brother and Christine? Eric staggered under this direct attack, kept silent for a moment, dragged himself to a chair, and heaved a deep sigh. Then, speaking in short phrases and gasping for breath between the words, Persian, don't talk to me about Count Felipe. He was dead by the time I left my house. He was dead when the siren rang. It was an accident, a sad, a very sad accident. He felt very awkwardly, but simply and naturally, into the lake. You lie, shouted the Persian. Eric bowed his head and said, I have not come here to talk about Count Felipe. But to tell you that, I am going to die. Where are Raoul and Christine? I am going to die. Raoul and Christine of love, Persian. I am dying of love. That is how it is. I loved her so, and I love her still. And I am dying of love for her. I, I tell you, if you knew how beautiful she was when she let me kiss her, alive, it was the first time, the first time I ever kissed a woman. Yes, alive. I kissed her alive, and she looked as beautiful as if she had been dead. The Persian shook Eric by the arm. Will you tell me if she is alive or dead? Why do you shake me like that? asked Eric, making an effort to speak more connectedly. I tell you that I am going to die. Yes, I kissed her alive. I think it's wild that he also has to add on that she was alive at the time that he kissed her like i kissed a girl and she was alive like does that mean that he's kissed girls that that weren't alive and this is the first one that he's kissed that has been alive am i reading too much into this <laughs> you kissed her alive well i kissed her dead who's the stronger one me i am <laughs> yeah mm. Mm -mm -mm. no thank you <laughs> the girls I kiss <laughs> just dying afterwards yeah mm -hmm. he lives in the catacombs right there's millions of dead girls down there
they're usually just dying afterwards. Yeah, it, it's wild. It's a wild experience. And now, is she dead? I tell you, I kissed her just like that on her forehead. And she did not draw back her forehead from my lips. Ah, oh, she is a good girl. As to her being dead, I don't think so. But it has nothing to do with me. No, no, she is not dead. And no one shall touch a hair of her head. She is a good, honest girl. And she saved her your life. At a moment when I would not have given two pence for your Persian skin. As a matter of fact, nobody bothered about you. Why were you there with that little chap? You would have died as well as he. That word, how she entreated me for her little chap. But I told her that, as she had turned the scorpion, she had, through that very fact, and of her own free will, become engaged to me, and that she did not need to have two men engaged to her, which was true. As for you, she didn't. you did not exist. You had ceased to exist, I tell you, and you were going to die with the other. Only mark me. When you were yelling like the devil because of the water, Christine came to me with her beautiful blue eyes, wide open, and swore to me as she hoped to be saved, and that she consented to be my living wife. Until then, in the depths of her eyes, I had always seen my dead wife. It was the first time I saw my living wife there. She was sincere. As she hoped to be saved, she would not kill herself. It was a bargain. Half a minute later, all the water was back in the lake, and I had a hard job with you, for upon my honor I thought you were done for. However, there you were. It was understood that I was to take you both up to the surface of the earth, when, at last, I cleared the Louis Philippe room for you. I came back alone. This is wild, yes. This is wild and deranged, and I'm uncomfortable. What have you done with the Vicomte? asked the Persian, interrupting me. Ah, you see, I couldn't carry him up like that at once. He was a hostage, but I could not keep him in the house on the lake either because of Christine, so I locked him up comfortably. I chained him up nicely, a whiff of the Mazenderan scent had left him as limp as a rag in the communist's dungeon, which is in the most deserted and remote part of the opera, below the fifth cellar where no one ever comes, and where no one ever hears you. Then I came back for Christine. She was waiting for me. Eric here rose solemnly. He then continued, but as he spoke, he was overcome by, an, by all his former emotion and began to tremble like a leaf. Yes, she was waiting for me waiting for me to, waiting for me alive, a real living bride, as she hoped to be saved. And when I came forward more timid than a little child, she did not run away. No, no, she stayed. She waited for me. I even believe that she put out her forehead a little, oh, not so much, just a little, like a living bride, and, and I kissed her. I, 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 and she did not die. Oh, how good it is to kiss somebody on the forehead. You can't tell, but I, I, my mother, my poor, unhappy mother, would never let me kiss her. She used to run away and throw me my mask. Nor any other woman, ever. Oh, you can understand, my happiness was so great, I cried. 
and I fell at her feet crying, and I kissed her feet, her little feet crying. You're crying too, and she cried also. The angel cried. Hey, weirdos have to be happy have to be happy to just be the consolation prize. The kidnapping, murder, the blackmailing, not accepting a simple no are the issue here. You know, <laughs> there is a lot going on here. Yep. Eric sobbed aloud and the Persian himself could not retain his tears in the presence of that masked man, who, with his shoulders shaking and his hands clutched at his chest, was moaning with pain and love by turns. Yes, I felt her tears flow on my forehead, on mine, mine. They were soft, they were sweet, they trickled under my mask, they mingled with my tears in my eyes. They flowed between my lips. Listen, listen to what I did. I tore off my mask so as not to lose one of her tears. And she did not run away. And she did not die. She remained alive, weeping over me, with me. We cried together. I have tasted all the happiness the world can offer. And Eric fell into a chair, choking for breath. I am not going to die yet. Presently I shall. But let me cry. Listen. Listen to this. While I was at her feet, I heard her say, Poor unhappy Eric. And she took my hand. I had become no more, you know, than a poor dog ready to die for her. I mean it. I held in my hand a ring, a plain gold ring which I had given her, which she had lost, and which I had found again. A wedding ring, you know. I slipped it into her little hand and said, there, take it. Take it for you and him. It shall be wedding present. A present from your poor, unhappy Eric. I know you love the boy. Don't cry any more. She asked me in a very soft voice what I meant. Then I made her understand that, where she was concerned, I was only a poor dog, ready to die for her, but that she could marry the young man when she pleased, because... She had cried with me and mingled her tears with mine. Eric's emotion was so great that he had to tell the Parisian not to look at him, for he was choking and must take off his mask. The Persian went to the window and opened it. His heart was full of pity, but he took care to keep his eyes fixed on the trees in the Tuileries garden, for lest he should see the monster's face. I went and released the young man, Eric continued, and told him to come with me to Christine. They kissed before me in the Louis Philippe room. Christine had my ring. I made Christine swear to come back one night when I was dead, crossing the lake from the Rue Scribe side, and bury me in the greatest secrecy with bury me in the greatest secrecy with the gold ring which she was to wear until that moment. I told her where she would find my body and what to do with it. Then Christine kissed me for the first time, herself, here, on the forehead, don't look, here, on the forehead, on my forehead, mine, don't look. And they went off together the Persian had once, once shown him, that which he held dearest in the world, all Christine Day's papers, which she had well writ had written for Raoul's benefit and left with Eric, together with a few objects belonging to her 
such as a pair of gloves, a shoe buckle, and two pocket handkerchiefs. In reply to the Persian's questions, Eric told him that the two young people, as soon as they found themselves free, had resolved to go and look for a priest in some lonely spot where they could hide their happiness, and that, with this object in view, they had started from the northern railway station to the world. Lastly, Eric relied on the Persian as soon as he received the promised relics and papers to inform the young couple of his death and to advertise it in the talk. That was all. The Persian saw Eric to the door of his flat, and Darius helped him down to the street. The cab was waiting for him. Eric stepped in, and the Persian, who had gone back to the window, heard him say to the driver, Go to the opera. And the cab drove off into the night. The Persian had seen the poor, unfortunate Eric for the last time. Three weeks later, the Epoch published this advertisement. Eric is dead. Epilogue I have now told the singular but very voracious story of the opera ghost. As I declared on the first page of this work, it is no longer possible to deny that Eric really lived. There are today so many proofs of his existence within the reach of everybody that we can follow Eric's actions logically through the whole tragedy of the Shagneys. There's no need to repeat here how greatly the case excited the capital, the kidnapping of the artist, the death of the Comte de Chagny under such exceptional conditions, the disappearance of his brother, the drugging of the gas man at the opera, and of his two assistants. What tragedies, what passions, what crimes had sur surrounded the ideal of Raoul and the sweet and charming Christine? What had become of the wonderful, mysterious artist of whom the world was never, never to hear again? She was represented as the victim of a rivalry between the two brothers, and nobody suspected what had really happened. Nobody understood that, as Raoul and Christine had both disappeared, both had withdrawn far from the world to enjoy a happiness which they would not have cared to make public after the inexplicable death of Count Philippe. They took the train one day from the northern railway station of the world. Possibly, I too shall take the train at that station one day, and go and seek around thy lakes, O Norway, O silent Scandinavia, for the, for the perhaps still living traces of Raoul and Christine, and also Mama Valerius, who disappeared at the same time. Possibly, some day, I shall hear the lonely echoes of the North repeat the singing of her who knew the angel of music. Long after the case was pigeonholed by the unintelligent case of Monsieur, Monsieur Fury, the newspapers made efforts at intervals to fathom the mystery. One evening paper alone, which knew all the gossip of the theatres, said, We recognize the touch of the opera ghost. And even that was written by the way of irony. The Persian alone knew the whole truth and held the main proofs which came to him with the pious relics promised by the ghost. It fell to my lot to complete those proofs with the aid of the Persian himself. Day by day I kept him informed of the progress of my inquiries, and he directed them. He had not been to the opera for years and years, but he had preserved the most accurate recollection of the building, and there was no better guide than he possible to help me discover its most secret recesses. He also told me where to gather further information, whom to ask, and he sent me to call on Monsieur Peligny at a moment when the poor man was nearly drawing his last breath. I had no idea that he was so very ill, and I shall never forget the effect which my questions about the ghost produced upon him. It's cool that the secret of the opera ghost was revealed, 
but what about the freaking flaming skull that draws a bunch of rats behind him true i need to know about the rat catcher that was not ever explained <laughs> ever <laughs> goodness gracious <laughs> terrible I had no idea that he was so very ill, and I shall never forget the effect which my questions about the ghost produced upon him. He looked at me as if I were the devil, and answered only in a few incoherent sentences which showed, however, that I was the main thing, the extent of the perturbation which O.G. in his time had brought into that already very restless life for Monsieur Pig Poligny was what people call a man of pleasure. When I came and told the Persian of the poor result of my visit to Monsieur Poligny, the Persian gave a faint smile and said, Poligny never knew how far that extraordinary black guard of an Eric humbugged him. The Persian, by the way, spoke of Eric sometimes as a demigod, and sometimes as the lowest of the low. Poligny was superstitious, and Eric knew it. Eric knew most things about the public and private affairs of the opera. When Monsieur Poligny heard a mysterious voice tell him, in Box 5, of the manner in which he used to spend his time and abuse his partner's confidence, he did not wait to hear any more. Thinking at first that it was a voice from heaven, he believed himself damned. And then, when the voice began to ask for money, he saw that he was being victimized by a shrewd blackmailer to whom... Debine himself had fallen a prey. Both of them, already tired of management, for reasons, went away without trying to investigate. Both of them, <laughs> already tired of management for various reasons, went away without trying to investigate further into the personality of that curious O.G., who had forced such a singular memorandum book upon them. They bequeathed the whole mystery to their successors, and heaved a sigh of relief when they were rid of a business that had puzzled them without amusing them the least. Remember a labyrinth from the musical, but not a full-on magical mystery tour. That's upsetting. I then spoke to this two successors and expressed my surprise that, in his memoirs of a manager, Monsieur Moncharmin should describe the opera ghost's behavior as at such length in the first part of the book and hardly mention it at all in the second. To, in reply to this, the Persian who knew the memoirs as thoroughly as if he had written them himself, observed that I should find the explanation of the whole business if I would just recollect the few lines which Moncharmin devotes to the ghost in the second part aforementioned, aforesaid. I quote these lines, which are particularly interesting because they describe the very simple manner in which the famous incident of the 20,000 francs was closed. As for O.G., some of those curious tricks I have related in the first part of my memoirs, I will only say that he redeemed by one spontaneous, fine action all the worry which he had caused my dear friend and partner, and, I am bound to say myself, he felt, no doubt, that there are limits to a joke especially when it is so expensive and when the commissary of police has been informed, for, at a moment, when we had made an appointment in our office with Monsieur Mifroid, I tell him the whole story. A few days after the disappearance of Christine Dei, we found, on Richard's table, a large envelope inscribed in red ink with O.G.'s compliments. It contained the large sum of money which he had succeeded in playfully extracting, for the time being, from the treasury. Richard was at once of the opinion that we must be content with that and drop the business. I agreed with, with Richard. All's well that ends well. 
What do you say, M. G.? Of course, Montcharmin, especially after the money had been restored, continued to believe that he had, for a short while, been the butt of Richard's sense of humor, whereas Richard, on his side, was convinced that Montcharmin had amused himself by inventing the whole of the affair of the opera ghost, in order to avenge himself for a few jokes. I asked the Persian to tell me by what trick the ghost had taken twenty thousand francs from Richard's pocket in spite of the safety pin. He replied that he had not gone into his little detail, but that, if I myself cared to make an investigation on the spot, I should certainly find the solution to the riddle in the manager's office by remembering that Eric had not been nicknamed the trapdoor lover for nothing. I promised the Persian to do so as soon as I had time, and I may as well tell the reader at once that the results of my investigation were perfectly satisfactory, and I hardly believed that I should ever discover so many undeniable proofs of the authenticity of the feats ascribed to the ghost. The Persian's manuscript, Christine Day's papers, the statements made to me by the people who used to work under Messieurs Richard and Montcharmin by little Meg herself, the worthy Madame Geary, I am sorry to say, is no more. And by Sorelli, who is now living in retirement at... Oh, man. Louveciennes? All the documents relating to the existence of the ghost, which I propose to deposit in the archives of the opera, have been checked and confirmed by a number of important discoveries, of which I am justly proud. I have not been able to find the house on the lake, Eric having blocked up all the secret entrances. On the other hand, I have discovered the secret passage of the communists, the planking of which is falling to pieces in parts, and also the trapdoor through which Raoul and the Persian penetrated into the cellars of the opera house. In the communists' dungeon, I noticed numbers of initials traced on the walls by the unfortunate people confined in it and among these were R and S.C. R.C. Raoul de Chagny. The letters are there to this day. The trapdoor lover, or is he a lover of trapdoors, or does he prefer to love via trapdoor? Hmm. <laughs> you bring up some great questions. If the reader will visit the opera one morning and ask leave to stroll where he pleases, without be ac being accompanied by a stupid guide, let him go to box five and knock with his fist or stick on the enormous column that separates this from the stage box. He will find that the column sounds hollow. After that, do not be astonished by the suggestion that he was accompanied by the voice of the ghost. There is room inside the column for two men. If you are surprised that, when the various incidents occurred, no one turned round to look at the column, you must remember that it is presented that it presented the appearance of solid marble, and that the voice contained in it seemed rather to come from the opposite side, for, as we have seen, the ghost was an expert ventriloquist. The column was elaborately carved and decorated with the sculptor's chisel and I do not despair of one day discovering the ornament that could be raised or lowered at will, so as to admit of the ghost's mysterious correspondence with Madame Geary and of his generosity. However, all these discoveries are nothing, to my mind, compared with that which I was able to make in the presence of the acting manager in the manager's office, within a couple of inches from the desk chair and which consisted of a trapdoor, the width of a board in the flooring, and the length of a man's forearm, and no longer a trapdoor that falls back like the lid of a box, a trapdoor through which I can see a hand come and dexterously fumble at the pocket of a swallow tailcoat. That is the way the twenty thousand francs went, and that also is the way by which through some trick or other, they were returned.
Speaking about this to the Persian, I said, so we may take it, as the twenty thousand francs were returned, that Eric was simply amusing himself with that memorandum book of his? Don't you believe it, he replied. Eric wanted money. Thinking himself without the pale of humanity, he was restrained by no scruples, and he employed his extraordinary gifts of dexterity and imagination, which he had received by way of compensation for his extraordinary ugliness, to prey upon his fellow men. His reasons for restoring the twenty thousand francs of his own accord was that he no longer wanted it. He had relinquished his marriage with Christine. He had relished everything above the surface of the earth. According to the Persian's account, Eric was born in a small town not far from Rowan. He was the son of a master mason. He ran away at an early age from his father's house, where his ugliness was a subject of horror and terror to his parents. For a time, he frequented the fairs, where a showman exhibited him as the living corpse. He seems to have crossed the whole of Europe, from fair to fair, and to have completed his strange education as an artist and magician at the very fountainhead of art and magic among the gypsies. A period of Eric's life remained quite obscure. He was seen at the fair of Nizhny Novgorod, where he displayed himself in all his hideous glory. He already sang as nobody on this earth had ever sung before. He practiced ventriloquism and gave displays of legerdemain so extraordinary that the caravans returning to Asia talked about it during the whole length of their journey. In this way, his reputation penetrated the walls of the palace of Mazenderan, where the little sultana, the favorite of the Shah and Shah, was boring herself to death. A dealer in furs, returning to Samarkand from Nizhny Novgorod, told of the marvels which he had seen performed in Eric's tent. The traitor was summoned to the palace, and the Persian of Mazandaran was told to question him. Next, the Daroga was instructed to go and find Eric. He brought him to Persia, where for some months Eric's will was law. He was guilty of not a few horrors, for he seemed not to know the difference between good and evil. He took part calmly in a number of political assassinations, and he turned his diabolical inventive powers against the emir of Afghanistan, who was at war with the Persian Empire. The Shah took a liking to him. This was the time of the rosy hours of Mazenderam, of which the Jerogus narrative has given us a glimpse. Eric had very original ideas on the subject of architecture and thought out a palace much as a conjurer contrives a trick casket. The Shah ordered him to construct an edifice of this kind. Eric did so. And the building appears to have been so ingenious that His Majesty was able to move about in it unseen and to disappear without a possibility of the tricks being discovered. When the Shah and Shah found himself the possessor of this gem, he ordered Eric's yellow eyes to be put out. But he reflected that, even when blind, Eric would still be able to build so remarkable a house for another sovereign, and also, as long as Eric was alive, someone would know the secret of the wonderful palace. Eric's death was decided upon, together with that of all the laborers who had worked under his orders. The execution of this abominable decree devolved upon the Daroga of Mazenderan. Eric had shown him some slight services and procured him many a hearty laugh. He saved Eric by providing him with the means of escape, but nearly paid with his head for his generous indulgence. Fortunately for the Persian, a corpse 
half eaten by the birds of prey was found on the shore of the caspian sea and was taken for eric's body because the persian's friends had dressed the remains and clothing that belonged to eric he was let off with the loss of the imperial favor the confiscation of his poverty and an order of perpetual ban banishment as a member of the royal house however he continued to receive a monthly pension of a few hundred francs from the Persian treasury, and on this he came to live in Paris. As for Eric, he went to Asia Minor and thence to Constantinople, where he entered the Sultan's employment. In explanation of the services which he was able to render, a monarch haunted by perpetual terrors, I need only say that it was Eric who constructed all the famous trapdoors and secret chambers and mysterious strong boxes which were found at Yildiz Kiosk after the last Turkish Revolution. He also invented those auto autom automata dressed like the Sultan and resembled the Sultan in all respects, which made people believe that the commander of the faithful was awake at one place when, in reality, he was asleep elsewhere. Of course, he had to leave the sultan's service for the same reasons that made him fly from Persia. He knew too much. Then, tired of his adventurous, formidable, and monstrous life, he longed to be someone like everybody else, and he became a contractor, like any ordinary contractor, building ordinary houses with ordinary bricks. He tended he tendered for part of the foundations of, in the opera. His estimate was accepted. When he found himself in the cellars of the enormous playhouse, his artistic, fantastic, wizard nature resumed the upper hand. Besides, was he not as ugly as ever? He dreamed of creating his own use, a dwelling unknown for the rest of the world, where he could hide from men's eyes for all time. The reader knows and guesses the rest. It is all in keeping with his this incredible and yet voracious story. Poor, unhappy Eric. Shall we pity him? Shall we curse him? He asked only to be someone, like everybody else, but he was too ugly, and he had to hide his genius or use it to play tricks with when, with an ordinary face, he would have been one of the most distinguished of mankind. He had a heart that could have held the empire of the world, and, in the end, he had to content himself with a cellar. Ah, oh, yes, we must needs pity the opera ghost. I have prayed over his mortal remains, that God might show him mercy, notwithstanding his crimes. Yes, I am sure, quite sure, that I prayed beside his body the other day when they took it from the spot where they were burying the phonographic records. It was his skeleton. I did not recognize it by the ugliness of the head, for all men are ugly when they have been dead as long as that, but by the plain gold ring which he wore and which Christine had certainly slipped on his finger when she came to bury him in accordance with her promise. The skeleton was lying near the little well in the place where the angel of music first held Christine's, Christine fainting in his trembling arms, on the night when he carried her down to the cellars of the opera house. And now, what did they mean to do with that skeleton? Surely they were not bury it in the common grave. I say that the place of the skeleton of the ghost of the opera ghost is in the archives of the National Academy of Music. It is no ordinary skeleton. And that is the end. <laughs> we did it. We finished the book. Yay! That's two full length. Two. Two full-length spoopy books, because we read Frankenstein as well. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, how did we feel about this? This is my first... 
<laughs> this is my first exposure to just the story of Phantom of the Opera, as I've mentioned a million and 12 times. I have not read this before. I have not seen any iteration or adaptation of Phantom of the Opera. I really only knew about, like, a mask um, and about uh, the chandelier. That's all I knew about it. So it's... I enjoyed it. Uh, there were a couple really cool times in the story structure where we're having things happen at the same time, but they're different chapters. And so it's like, okay, this is happening. And then Raul walks in and then we get like Raul's perspective of what's happening during this time. And then there's also instances where we get parallel in the same chapter of things that are happening with different characters and like seamlessly flowing. Um, the scene where uh, Raul and our Persian friend are underneath the stage and it has them talking and everything, but then we get the um, the commissary talking and all of these other things and like them trying to figure out what happened to Christine. So it is interesting. Very strange people, unexplained magic, not a single mummy toe, but overall entertaining. <laughs> I am a little sad that there were zero out of ten mummy toes in this. <laughs> but yeah, I did I did like it. It was entertaining. It I don't know what I expected, but I think it both fulfilled what I was expecting and didn't fulfill like went beyond, like went a different way of what I was expecting. You're pretty sure that the sequel is 40% mummy, mummy Toes? Excellent. But yes, that is going to be it for tonight. Thank you all for joining me. I appreciate it, and I appreciate you. Um, if I don't see you next time, I hope to see you very soon. As always, whether you lurk, whether you chat, I 1,000% appreciate you, and I 1,000% appreciate your support. Have a good one, everybody. Take care. Drink some water. Rest your eyeballs all those things. Goodbye.